Well, good morning. We got a couple more uh, torsion problems for you today. Uh, so the first one uh, laid out here on the sheet in front of you, uh, it's got a bit of a, a complication in it and that it is going to be indeterminate in that our, we don't have sufficient statically equilibrium equations in order to fully resolve the problem or determine the reactions. And so we're going to have to use our method of superposition, uh, which we've talked about before when we were looking at uh, axial load. Uh, to solve for the reactions. So the method is identical to what we did in axial load. So if you're still struggling to understand superposition and how we were able to use superposition to solve for or, or to, to derive a compatibility equation to solve for statically indeterminate problem, I'm going to leave a bunch of cards up here. I uh, really think that if you don't quite get it yet, it's easier to understand and conceive when we're looking at uniaxial load. So you might want to step back, have a relook, get comfortable with it. Uh, the method is identical to what we're going to do here. And so we're just going to be plowing right ahead and going on and, and in fairly quick order, solving this reasonably simple problem. Although it's one of those things that students struggle with is understanding that superposition method to solve statically indeterminate problems. So we have a, a rod. So this rod is got supports at both ends. It's fixed at A, fixed at C. And then there is a torque applied to it somewhere in the middle, some length AB uh, from A uh, to, to try to impose a, a twist on it. Um, so when we look at this, of course, we see that we have two reactions. Of course, the only equation of static equilibrium we have is the sum of the forces about the x-axis is equal to zero. And, and so we come up short. We come up short by one equation. So not only is it statically indeterminate, but we can determine that it is statically indeterminate to the first degree. So what that means to us is that we need to look at the displacements in order to derive one equation uh, of compatibility or compatibility equation so that we can solve for the reactions and ultimately the problem itself. So these problems always start uh, at the free body diagram. So I've laid out my sheet to get ready for this. I'm going to label my free body diagram down here. So a couple of reactions here. One at each end. So torque at A, torque at C, our applied force or applied torque in this case at B. And that is just identified as T. And so that's pretty much our entire system. Now, because we're going to be using superposition, we know that we want to break this up into a primary and a secondary system, which is to say we need to, re to remove one of the reactions to allow it to, to form without that second reaction and then add it back in as an applied force. So in this case, I'm going to choose to remove the reaction at C. So I need to build my primary system without it. And we'll go ahead, we'll put in the reaction at A, in this case T, A, and we'll give it a prime. And we'll add our applied force or our applied torque at B is T. And we don't apply any uh, reaction because we've freed it up at C. And so there we have our primary system. And of course, our free body diagram has to be the sum of our primary system and our redundant system. So again, in our redundant system, we have our T at A, in this case, with a double prime. We don't have a T because we've already added it to our primary system. But in this case, we're going to add our torque at C as if it was an applied load. And so we have our torque at C. 
And I think they all add up and that pretty much is our system. And now what we want to do is we want to, I guess, dig in a little bit and look at the deflections or angles of twist that these systems would be causing. And very specifically, if I look at the angle of twist in the primary system at the end at C, we know that that is going to be uh, phi at C prime. And the angle of twist at C here would be double prime. And very, very similar to the problem that we looked at in axial loads, the sum of those here would be equal to zero, right? Because it's fixed, it can't move. So they're ultimately the sum of these two displacements has to bring it back to zero. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be compatible with the fixed end that uh, exists there. In many ways, uh, what we've just drawn up uh, and broken up into our primary and our redundant system and putting in our deflections the way we know it about a key point where the deflections are equal to zero, we have all the logic apparatus that we need in order to be able to derive our compatibility equation. So we can pretty much take our compatibility equation right off the diagram. It's in, incorporated in how we have labeled our deflections. So our angle of twist at C in the primary system plus our angle of twist at C in our redundant system have to sum together to bring us back to zero. And so that is our compatibility equation. Now, recall our equation for angle of twist is equal to the torque over the length of which it's applied divided by polar moment of inertia and our shear modulus. And so we're going to substitute in for each of phi prime c and phi double prime c in order to get that. So let's go back to our diagrams uh, just for a split second and let's see what we have. So if I were to look at our primary system, the only section that is loaded or under torsion is the section between A and B. And if I were to cut that, throw away everything to the left, we see that it is under a torque T uh, or a negative T because of the direction that it is shown. Now, if we go on and look at our redundant system, uh, again, I'm gonna throw away everything to the left because that is certainly unknown. We're going to give it a split. We see that it is uh, loaded or in torsion between A and C all the way across its entire length. And the value there is going to be T sub C. So with that, with, with those two little bits of information, we're able to fill out our equations up here. So I'm going to use my equation for displacement and substitute them in for the two different displacements. So looking first at uh, phi at C prime, we know that the torque is going to be negative T and it will apply over the length between A and B, which is length AB. And that's divided through by J and G, which are constant over the length, so we don't need any subscripts. And to that, we have to add phi at C double prime. And so from our redundant system, we see that that is equal to the torque, which is equal to the reaction at C, T sub C, positive and it is applied over the entire length divided by jg and of course that has to be equal to zero as we indicated in our compatibility equation so we're just going to do a little bit of substituting and simplifying uh, just to get ourselves so that length keep in mind could also be expressed as uh, length AB plus length BC. And of course, the J's and G's cancel out and everything else. And so we can get uh, isolate on our, our T sub C. And we see that it is equal to the torque times the length AB divided by L, which is one of our reactions.
So having used our compatibility equation, now all we have to do is go on and apply our equilibrium. And we should be able to resolve the other uh, equation. So let's apply our equilibrium equation. So we have the sum of the torques about x set it equal to zero. And I'll work uh, left to right. So we have the torque at A minus our torque T plus our torque at C. And that's all equal to zero. I can substitute in for that our T LAB over L. And if we isolate on torque at A is equal to our T minus T L A B over L. Okay, I'm just going to scratch some algebra here to the side. So that's T sub A is equal to, if I multiply through by L, it's T times L A B plus L B C divided by L minus T L A B divided by L. And so we should be able to simplify that down to give us a T sub A is equal to our T L B C divided by L, which is similar to, to what we got for T sub C and makes a lot of sense for us. With that information, let's get that back onto our free body diagram and see if we can't uh, tidy up a, and draw our uh, torque force diagram. So I'm just going to, so T sub A, this is equal to T LBC divided by L. This is equal to T LAB divided by L. And so now what we should be able to do is we should be able to draw our torque force diagram. We're going to do it using the graphical method. So I'm going to look at the value at A, which is TLBC divided by L. It's positive applied, so it's going to be negative inside. So it's going to come down to some value here. And then the torque is going to push it up. And then it will be constant across. And so we have our two values. We have negative T LBC divided by L. And we have positive T LAB divided by L. And we can finish that off by closing our diagram. And we have our torque force diagram. And we'll just give that a quick label torque force diagram. We don't have any units because we're just working in variables in this instance. And let's see what else did the question ask. We wanted a torque force diagram as well as we needed an angle of twist. So to get the angle of twist, of course, what we need to do is know the relative displacement either between A and B or C and B because both A and C are at zero. So whatever that relative to, uh, angle of twist is will tell us what the angle of twist is at B. So let's say angle of twist at B. And so we know our angle of twist at B is equal to our angle of twist AB, which is equal to our torque between AB, LAB, divided by J and G. So I'm just going to substitute, substitute in for our torque between A and B. And we know that that is negative T LBC divided by L. When I simplify that, I get our torque LAB times LBC divided by J G L. And so what we need to do is now put that onto our diagram. Okay, I need to throw a negative sign in there. And that's our displacement uh, between A and B, which is also the angle of twist at B. So we need to draw that. So starting at zero at A, we're going to draw it down to our value. 
negative T L A B L B C divided by J G L and at which point it starts to twist the other direction and brings us back to zero at the other support. And we should label that. That's going to be our phi at x. And there we have it. So I hope you see that the method of superposition, the application of uh, compatible displacements to a arrive at the compatibility equation in conjunction with our one equation of static equilibrium was all we needed to solve the problem. It's also identical to the method that we used or how we use that same method uh, when we were looking at axial problems. So we're going to do one more of these. I'm going to spice it up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to change some of the materials out so we have different materials, different parts of the, uh, the rod, and we'll throw in some numbers so that we're actually doing a, a proper calculation. So hopefully that was useful to you. I, I will leave a link here to the next video. I think it's a good complement to, to what we did here. And so between the two of them, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to uh, uh, nail down how to apply the method of superposition to solve for a statically indeterminate torsion problem.